Hey everyone, we're going to get started in just a minute here. We're just letting folks um, that are still joining get on and hopefully we'll be able to get started in just a few seconds. All right. Well, welcome everyone. I hope that you're here tonight to join us for this information session that we're going to be hosting on a couple air permits that are um, in review right now with Air Quality Division at Eagle. There are two different proposed air permits for two different FCA facilities that are kind of adjacent to each other. So we're going to be providing a bunch of information about that tonight, but before we really get started on all the nitty gritty nitty gritty details, I am going to um, do a little bit of housekeeping for you so you know how things are going to run. If you haven't done a Zoom meeting with us yet, um, you'll know that uh, there's a few different things and how we normally do them. So the first thing we're going to do is I just want to kind of go over who's going to be here tonight to answer questions for you. So I'm Jennifer Dixon and I actually work in our environmental support division. But if you've gone, come to these meetings before, you've probably seen me hosting and moderating the question and answer session. So you'll also see, so I'm going to ask my staff folks to kind of give a little wave when I say your name. So the other person you're going to be hearing mostly from tonight is Dave Thompson, and he is our permit engineer for the project. So I'm going to pass the mic over to him in a minute, and he's going to give you a little bit of information about the projects before that we do the Q&A. And because I see him next in my queue, I have Mike Deppa, and he is with our toxics unit. There's Mike. Um, also Bob Burns, he's one of our inspectors and he works with our auto facilities a lot. So we'll have him on the line to answer some questions for you as well if needed. I've also got Susan Kilmer. She's from our air monitoring unit and she'll be able to talk to you about the air monitors in the area um, and things associated with that. I also have Steph Hengensbach and she is in our, and I probably said your name wrong, Steph. Nod or shake your head if I did all right, kind of. Every time, I know, I apologize. So um, she actually works in our air uh, modeling unit. So she'll be able to talk about some of those things if you all have questions for her later. So um, I'm gonna ask you guys to, we're gonna go ahead and give it over to Dave in just a minute. So before we get started on the, the definite um, housekeeping stuff. I just want to kind of run you through how the evening's going to go. Like I said, Dave's going to give you some information about the two proposed projects. Um, we're going to do a question and answer session after that, and I'll tell you how to submit a question in a few minutes. We're also going to talk about how to submit an official comment, since both these are open for comment right now, and they will be open till September 18th. Just want to, I'll probably reiterate that a few times just so that you have it in your mind. We'll talk about where you can find information and who you can contact when you have further questions after tonight. All right. So during the meeting, your lines will all be muted. We are going to record this. And uh, there's a, the best way to answer, get your question answer is to type it in the question and answer box. You're going to find that on your toolbar. Um, once you put your question in there, we'll try to get to those probably at the end of Dave's presentation. Um, if you want to ask a question verbally after we get through the written questions, we will do that. So if you are on the internet or on your phone, you can click that raise your hand icon on the bottom of your screen and we will be able to unmute you. If you're calling in, which I should have checked to see if we have any Anybody calling in today. I'm just going to do that really quickly. Um, let's see. Doesn't look like we have anyone calling in right now, but we might get someone calling in later. So I'll just reiterate this now and I'll reiterate it again later that if you are calling in, you're just going to type star nine onto your phone and that actually raises your hand for us. So we'll be able to unmute you then as well. So now I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to Dave. So Dave, I'm going to man the presentation for you. So if I don't click when I'm supposed to, feel free to say next to me and don't forget to unmute yourself when it's your time to talk. All right, thank you, Jen. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Dave Thompson. I am the lead permit engineer and one of multiple AQD staff involved in the review for both of these applications. Uh, the proposed modifications to the automotive assembly line currently under construction at the FCA Detroit Assembly Complex MAC, which I'm going to refer to as the MAC, as MAC or the MAC plant. 
for short, and the proposed new equipment and changes at the FCA Jefferson North Assembly Plant, which I'm going to refer to as JNAP. Uh, we're going to start tonight with an overview of the air quality division and then get into the proposed projects. So we all know that pollution comes from many different things such as big farms, fuel burning vehicles and various industrial sources. The overall mission of the air quality division is to protect public health and the environment. The AQD has the authority to do this by regulating industrial sources. So next. So the AQD is separated into different functions. Uh, for example, some AQD staff monitor levels of air pollutants. Other staff look at different toxics to make sure public health is protected. Uh, district inspectors conduct inspections of regulated facilities and we review applications and write permits for sources of air pollutants to ensure the operations comply with our rules and regulations. Go next. Now the air quality division has the authority to permit sources of air pollutants. However, I want to point out a few items that the draft permit do not cover and that the AQD does not have the ability to regulate. You will wanna to talk to your local government if you have questions or comments about issues such as zoning, noise, and traffic. So next, I'd like to give a simple overview of the steps that both the applicant and the AQD go through to get a proposed draft permit ready for comment. First, the applicant plans the project. Next, the applicant submits a permit application to the air quality division. The application is reviewed by an engineer. Once a proposed permit is peer reviewed and approved by a supervisor, it is sent to the company for review and posted for public comment. Comments received during the public comment period are evaluated and could potentially lead to changes in the proposed permit. Finally, a decision is made on the permit application and that decision can be at one of three things. It can be approved as written, approved with changes or denied. Uh, next, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the proposed projects. Now, FCA operates both the MAC plant and the JNAP. They're all both automotive assembly lines. <clears throat> An automotive assembly line consists of three main portions. There is a body shop for assembly of the unpainted vehicle, a paint shop where various paints and other materials are applied, and the assembly area where final operations such as glass, engine, and tire installation are performed. And for the automotive, uh, so what is FCA requesting? Sorry, Jen, go to next, please. Sorry about that. Uh, so what is FCA requesting? Uh, for the automotive assembly line at the MAC plant, FCA is proposing changes to the supporting natural gas equipment for the line, a different number of tanks used for <coughs> automotive fluid storage, and a change in the number and size of different pieces of equipment, of emergency equipment. For the automotive assembly line at JNAP, FCA is proposing to install a new two-tone coating process, moving an existing repair operation and refurbishment and upgrades to some existing operations. Next. While reviewing the proposed projects, the AQD looks at a number of items. For, uh, for projects that take place within a relatively close time period, the AQD must determine whether projects should be aggregated or looked at as a single project. Now, after reviewing the two applications and applying guidance provided by the United States Environmental Protection Agency, the AQD determined that the proposed changes at the MAC plant and the JNAP project are separate. Therefore, the MAC and JNAP application reviews were performed independently from one another. So for each project, the AQD reviews the level of emissions to figure out how that project should be classified. And based upon the level of emissions and the type of equipment, we determine what type of review is needed, including which rules and regulations that project is subject to. Go next, Jen. So each application addresses specific state and federal regulations and whether that project is subject. Although it is already permitted and under construction, the MAC plant application is subject to what is referred to as non-attainment regulations for volatile organic compounds, also known as VOCs, based on the level of proposed emissions. 
Each project is also subject to and must meet other applicable rules and regulations, and we'll go into that a little more detail in the, in the next few slides. Now, throughout the review process and during development of the proposed draft permits, the AQD has ensured that the applicable state and federal rules have been met. Next slide, please. So one part of figuring out whether specific rules are applicable to a project is the location of the facility. This map shows the current attainment status for the state of Michigan. An area is considered to be in non-attainment if air concentrations of certain pollutants are above the national standards. And Michigan currently has non-attainment areas for two pollutants, which are ozone and sulfur dioxide, which is also known as SO2. You now the MAC plant and JNAP are located in an area that is considered non-attainment for ozone, which is regulated through two other pollutants, VOCs and oxides of nitrogen, which is also called NOx. If the overall increase in emissions from an individual project for these pollutants is high enough, then that pollutant needs to go through what is called a non-attainment permit review. Okay. Next, Jen, sorry. Now the MAC plant, as I said, <clears throat> plant project is subject to non-attainment permit review for VOCs. One part of non-attainment permit review is performing a lowest achievable emission rate or layer analysis. This means that the MAC plant project must meet or exceed the lowest emission rate required by any state rule or the lowest emission rate that has been achieved in practice for similar processes. Now the previous layer review was reevaluated and with the exception of one additional limit for two small emergency engines result, resulted in the same conclusions. This includes the use of thermal oxidizers on the large coating operations to reduce the amount of VOC emissions. Another important piece of non-attainment non permit review sorry, is referred to as offsets. Now, offsets are emission reductions in the same pollutant from the same non-attainment area that must be greater than the emissions increased from the proposed project. The proposed level of VOCs from the MAC pro plant project did not change significantly from the previous review. It, there was a slight reduction, um, but therefore the required amount of offsets did not change. Now these offsets or emission reductions were established with the original MAC plant permit. Since there is no increase in the proposed VOC emissions, no additional offsets are required. Next, thank you. In addition to meeting non-attainment review requirements, the MAC plant application shows that the project will meet other applicable rules and regulations, including toxic air contaminants emitted from the project would meet their respective health-based screening levels. Computer simulations referred to as modeling were performed for NOx and particulate matter equal to or less than 2.5 microns, which is in short is known as PM 2.5. And this modeling showed that no violation of any national standard is expected. The assembly line would also be required to place particulate filters on all spray coating processes to lower the amount of dust and paint particles that exit the plant. Next, I'll speak a little more about the proposed JNAP project as it must also comply with the applicable rules and regulations. For example, the project must show that it would comply with State of Michigan Rule 702 for VOCs. This review is based on what is referred to as a best available control technology or backed analysis. And as a result of that backed analysis for the JNAP project, VOCs from the proposed two-tone coating operation would be controlled by thermal oxidizers. In addition, similar to the other project, <clears throat> the JNAP application has shown that compound that tax, toxic air contaminants emitted from the project would meet their health-based screening levels. Modeling, <clears throat> again, was performed for NOx and PM 2.5 to show that no violation of any national standard is expected. And again, for spray coating processes, particulate control systems would be required to reduce, to reduce particulate emissions. So if the permits are approved, FCA would have to comply with all final conditions that have incorporated the review of state and federal regulations. Based on the reviews performed, the final conditions for each proposed permit contains the emission limits for the pollutants listed here, which are VOCs, particulate matter, which is shortened to PM, 
Uh, there's another one that's particulate matter equal to or less than 10 microns, which is known as PM10, PM2.5, NOx, SO2, and carbon monoxide, which is known as CO, as well as limits on natural gas usage. Each proposed draft permit also contains testing, monitoring, and record keeping requirements that would be used to show that both the MAC plant and the JNAP and JNAP would meet their respective limits. The combination of emission limits with testing, monitoring, and record keeping requirements would ensure that each project complies with the rules and regulations. I'd like to thank you for listening and I'll give back to Jen and uh, we'll continue with the question and answer portion. All right, thanks Dave, we'll let you get a drink of water. I know how that goes when you're chatting for a while. So we have a couple more things to go over again. I guess, and of course my dogs are gonna start barking, I apologize. Um, I think my kids just got home, which is perfect timing. <laughs> so thank you Dave for passing that back to me right now. Um, so just as a reminder about asking questions, if you could click on your Q&A and, and your toolbar and then go ahead and type any questions that you have in there. If you are um, on the computer or on your phone, you can click the raise your hand icon. And once we get to those written in questions, we'll unmute people's mics and let them chat as well. Oh, one thing I forgot to mention about the Q&A portion, if you want to be anonymous, um, when you're asking your question, there is a box that you can check to ask your question anonymously. That's perfectly okay. We, we don't mind people doing that at all, and people sometimes prefer to do that. So um, if you are calling in and you would like to raise your hand to ask a question, you're going to just type star nine into your phone, and that's going to actually raise your hand on our side of the screen here, so we'll be able to unmute you. Um, let's see, so as a reminder, if I can have my panelists turn your videos back on so we can be ready to answer questions. Um, you already heard from Dave Thompson on, in our permit section. We've got Bob Burns again. He's our district inspector that um, helps us out with auto plant stuff. I've got Steph, and I'm not going to say your last name because I refuse this time. Um, and Modeling, I'm going to practice afterwards. So, and the next meeting on September 9th, I'm going to say it perfectly. Um, Mike Deppa from our toxics unit. We've got Susan Kilmer with air monitoring, and um, we should be good to go. So, I'm going to talk about this part later, actually. We'll get back to that. Um, so, what I want to do now is, and I, of course, just messed that up. I apologize, folks. Um, we do have a question that's come in. So um, this is going to be for Bob. So Bob, just to, um, this is going to be a question on inspections. So the question is, have there been any recent inspections of either plant? And if so, were any violations noted? So if you could just talk on that for a minute, that'd be appreciated. Sure, Jennifer. Um, yeah, the facility was last inspected in November of 2019. Uh, the facility itself is inspected on a semi-annual basis. And so over the course of the past 10 years, there have been uh, at least five inspections. Uh, there still is a, another scheduled inspection coming up this fiscal year, which ends in October. So we will be doing one uh, very soon at this facility. And then in addition to the inspections, we also, um, visit the facility to observe stack testing. And there's been, I would say approximately 10 of those within the last 10 years. Um, I think there was also a question about uh, violation notices. Um, there was a violation that was sent back in 2018 um, for a failure to report a deviation as a result of that most recent past inspection. So can you just talk about what a deviation is? What does that, what does that mean? Yeah, sure. So in a renewable operating permit for this facility, they are required or obligated to report every six months that they are either in compliance with each condition in the permit or if they're deviating from that permit condition. So um, the facility had missed something that they were not exactly complying with the facility. And so they did not report as a deviation. Okay, thanks. And so you also used another word that we sometimes refer to, but people might not know what you mean. So you said renewable operating permit. So we're here to talk about two um, air permits, but the renewable operating permit is a large sort of all encompassing air permit that takes all these little ones and kind of sticks them all together. Um, obviously paraphrasing that, but if you want more information about that, um, feel free to put that question in the question box 
as well. Um, and this question is going to be more for you too, Bob, because it kind of has to do, do with what happens at, if the permits are issued or after they're issued. So the question was, what's the process for monitoring um, the facility after the permit is issued, after they're approved, and who does that kind of monitoring? Um, and then if after you answer that question, so think about that. And then the second part of this question is, you know, if a community member has concerns or complaints, what where should they go with those? All right, yeah, so the facility um, is required to uh, test or confirm emission factors or generate emission factors for many of the pollutants that Dave talked about in the permit. Um, so there will be testing for things like volatile organic compound capture efficiencies, removal efficiencies, destruction efficiencies, and they are required to do those within um, 365 days of saleable vehicle production. Um, those tests will be observed within that one year period after startup of the facility. And um, we will be out there observing those tests to, to make sure they follow the proper protocol and procedure. Um, so also, oh, sorry, go ahead. Before you, or before you go ahead on that, what I think what they might be talking about too is not just like um, things that are actual testing, but you know, a lot of, a big part of our air permits are things that the company might have to monitor on a daily, weekly, monthly, basis and the company a lot of times will keep those records yep that's true right okay thank you mm -hmm. um so the company keeps those records they have certain protocols that they have to do that we approve and then as part of bob's inspections when he goes out or other inspectors when they go out they will look at that monitoring information and that data that the company has kept and verify whether or not it's true, do a very thorough review of that, make sure there's no holes or those things sometimes we'll, that we refer to as deviations and, and things like that and whether or not a violation might need to be issued if something was going haywire. So I don't know, Bob, if you want to add a little bit more to that and then if you want to answer the second part of that question too. Yeah, sure. Uh, the source keeps all kinds of information um, in order to calculate the emissions uh, from the facility to show compliance. So on a daily basis, they track the amount of paint used, the types of paint used, uh, the volatile organic compounds uh, within the paint, and they can actually prorate that back to uh, on a daily basis to show how much is emitted from the facility each day. That is done uh, through the EPA auto protocol. They have a special procedure which they should follow and to obtain those records. In addition to the VOC style emission records, they keep track of natural gas records uh, for your, like your NOx and your CO emissions. Um, for the abatement equipment, they would do the monitoring uh, demonstrated in the permit. So they would keep, uh, for instance, the oxidizer temperatures that are going on to demonstrate that on an ongoing continuous basis, they would maintain above the 1400 degree limit within the permit. Awesome, thank you. So if there, if hopefully that was helpful. And then if you could answer the question about complaints, if they have complaints or concerns about things. And we can, if whoever we, they need to contact or whatever the recommendation is here, we can always share that after the meeting tonight um, with people either via email or um, on the screen too, so. Yes, we would, um, we can share the information in terms of the peace complaint line uh, mm -hmm. for at, after our calls and, um, my own personal cell phone number is 517-275-0439 uh, for odor complaints as well. And we will put that up on the screen towards the end um, with everybody's actual contact numbers. So um, if you are calling in and you need that information, you can um, raise your hand and we'll definitely read it out loud if there's something specific that you would like. Um, all right, so here is a question and it is a little bit of a long one. Um, all right, I think this is going to be for you, Dave. It's a, regarding back, so let me read it to you. Um, it says, it appears you're allowing FCA to avoid a true backed analysis based on a claim needing consistency with existing paint lines and are dismissing anything other than solvent, solvent based clear coat option as technically feasible. Why are they not required to modernize the entire paint line? 
And then there is a quote from the fact sheet. I don't know if you need me to read that part out loud, but while you're kind of thinking about your answer, Dave, I'll go ahead and do that just so folks that can't see this. So this is from our, from our fact sheet and it says, FCA is proposing tree lion solvent born base coats and a solvent born clear coat in the two-tone booth to maintain consistency with the materials and the coating quality from the current JNAP coating operations. So if you could talk about that a little bit, Dave, that'd be great. Yeah. Um... Well, I believe that they are showing a true fact analysis on this. The consistency comes from um, <clears throat> the existing solvent line. They went through a back analysis for this and showed that for that, they, <clears throat> they have an existing process uh, with the primer guide coat or e-coat guide coat primer top coat that is in the current process. And they showed that uh, Basically, to convert it over to a, another line, there is no available space for if you can, for example, if you convert over to water based for certain base coats, it requires larger ovens, larger space for that in order to emit. Um, and the, or and not, I'm sorry, not emit, <laughs> in order to cure. The, the water-based base coat as opposed to the solvent. So there's, there's <clears throat> based off of our discussions, there's not room in order to convert it over to that. And for a consistency of coating, there is there are differences between the various coating technologies for how consistent they are in order to get a consistent pro, a, a consistent coating between the two tone and the existing top coat. It, it really has to be a similar process of the um, goes through the powder coat and then goes through the top coat, solvent based top coat, solvent based clear coat in order to m maintain that consistent, the consistent quality between the top coat and the, and the rest of the vehicle. So, and they showed for the, for the existing line that the they went through a back analysis for the uncontrolled portions because there are portions of the existing top coat that are controlled. They went through that and based off of that backed analysis, there is a cost efficiency, basically a cost efficiency portion of that. And they have a, um, they did show that it was not cost effective for those portions of that and then in groupings of the existing top coat line. Okay. So this question has to do with um, how FCA is classified as a, an existing source rather than a new constructed source. So I think this one's going to go to you too, Dave. So I'm going to read this so people can hear the question. So um, it says, to my understanding, FCA has asserted that the renovated paint shop should be classified as an existing source rather than a new constructed source regarding federal air toxics regulations. Can you elaborate on this process? That is, why was FCA allowed to classify in such a way? So I'm not exactly sure what part of your, I think you've talk, talk, touched on this a little bit, but I'm not exactly sure. Um, uh, yeah, sure. Um, well, an existing source, there are specific definitions for an existing source in, in the niche app, and, or I'm sorry, the, the rule. Um, that is in here. It, uh, it's referred to as a niche app, uh, shortened national emission standard for hazardous air pollutants. And there are differences between an existing source and a new source. And for a source that was built before a certain date, and I don't remember what that date is off the top of my head, but when you do modifications or do changes to it, there's something called uh, reconstructed. And I'm sorry. Basically, if the if the money if the if the investment put into equipment that is subject to that niche app is less than fifty percent of the cost of a brand new identical process, then it is still it is still considered existing. If you spend over fifty percent of the initial of the total investment of a brand new, um, for example, paint shop similar to this then it would be considered new and reconstruct or reconstructed and would be subject to those new ones. But the, the uh, cost 
the investment portion that they provided show that it, the ratio was less than 50%. Um, and Bob, I guess I, I'm gonna throw this over to Bob Burns just to make sure that I didn't miss anything on, on that reconstruction answer, or if you'd answer, if that was complete enough, or if you have anything to add. No, I think that's a good explanation, Dave. The, I believe the existing source date is around 2006 and the Jefferson North facility, you know, has been there since the late 90s, at least in its current form or late 80s, early 90s. So they are an existing source and they have provided their source cost information for the emission units that are affected under the auto NESHAP or MAT. And uh, that, that value shows that they're investing less than half the cost of the new one. And so therefore the facility is not considered uh, reconstructed. Yeah, it's not triggering that definition of the of reconstruction, which is a complicated one for sure. Um, we do have a hand up, so I don't, I can't tell your name. So I'm going to say the last four digits on, I think it's your email address, which is 2003. And I'm going to unmute you so that you can ask your question. So I apologize. And if you'd like to introduce yourself, feel free. And if you don't want to, you don't have to. Um, my name is Ben Fung. I'm a resident of uh, Benetall Street, which is right next to the uh, Mac plant. Um, I don't see any uh, presentation about a continuous uh, particle emission from the paint shop because uh, the area that we live in right now has been known for um, respiratory um, diseases and compared with other areas. So I kind of worry about the, uh, the addition or the modification of this plant, of this uh, paint shop. So can you cover that for me? Yeah, sure, Ben. So I think the first thing I would like to do is, Dave, if I'm gonna pass it to you to talk a little about, bit about any particulate control that's going to be on that line, if there is any. And then after that, I don't know, Susan, if I can kind of pass it over to you to talk about um, Oh, some of the air monitoring that is done in the area, I think that would be really helpful. So Dave, if you wanna hand, tackle that first and um, thanks a lot for the question, Ben. Um, the way that this particular plant is, or uh, project is being approached from the um, PM emissions side, there is not a specific SEMS that is going in. However, there are multiple levels of- And when you say SEMS, you have to define- I'm sorry, that. continuous People don't emissions, know what that is. <laughs> continuous emissions monitoring system, <laughs> okay. sorry. No, that's fine. Um, however, there are multiple levels of PM control. Uh, for example, there are, is a water wash dry filter system, or water, water wash dry filter, water wash filter system on the coating lines. Then that's followed by another dry filter system uh, prior to um, a concentrator because if they don't filter that, it goes into a, uh, um, you know, it, it can clog up their, it can clog up their uh, concentrator and it also provides additional filtering. Um, every spray, every source of spray has um, a filter, has a filter system on it that they have to provide information for going forward. And in addition to that, there's testing as I said, there's testing provided at periodic time periods in order to verify their emission factors and um, <coughs> monitoring of those uh, things, you know, to verify that the particulate system is operating properly. So I'm listening to you describe it and I always feel like these kinds of things should be in a what's, how it's made video because you talked about a lot of things and I think it's hard to visualize. So maybe at our next meeting, we might wanna think about this, but um, so imagine, I guess if you will, and we're gonna really simplify this, but someone's standing with a paint spray can and they're paint and they're spraying it basically at like a curtain of water and that curtain's kind of pulling out some of those big particles. And then it also goes through a fabric filter system, kind of like you have on your furnace that pulls out even smaller particles. That doesn't mean that none are getting through, but they do have control on those. So hopefully that answer was helpful. Um, 
I definitely always put that in my brain, like this is a lot of things to kind of visualize, but, um, and Susan, I, I had wanted to pass it on to you next. And just as you're talking, um, if you could talk a little bit about nearby air quality monitoring sites in the area, just in general, and how many there are. We had that question come in after we mentioned that you were gonna be speaking. So if you wanna talk about that a little bit, that would be great. Sure, so we do have an air monitoring station at Osborne High School which is on East Seven Mile, and that's the site that's closest to the facility. Um, FCA is also going to establish an air monitoring station on their property. Um, and that station uh, the FCA is going to establish is going to measure PM 2.5 and the ni nitrogen oxides as well. Susan, do you want me to show that map really quick? I think we sure. have that. Yeah, that, that'd be helpful. Sure, let me see if I can pull that up a second. And our site at Osborne High School um, on E7 Mile also measures PM 2.5 and um, the oxides of nitrogen as well. So as you can see on the map um, where FCA's monitor is going to be, our Eagle Station is north of there. So in that general vicinity, um, there will be two air monitoring stations. We have quite a few other air monitors in Detroit that are in southwest Detroit um, and just some other areas of Detroit. And then north of there, we also have some monitoring stations in New Haven, Port Huron. Uh, we've got one in Oak Park, so kind of surrounding Detroit. Uh, we have quite a few air monitoring stations, but in Wayne County, we have a total, I believe it's 12, and eight are in the city of Detroit. So we do have quite a few over there, and if folks are interested, we can definitely share some links to information about those monitoring stations, It's specifically the one at East Seven Mile, if um, folks want to do that. Um, let me see here, get to share back to my other screen for you. There we go. So I don't have any other questions that have come in so far, and I don't see any raised hands. We still definitely have time. While you guys are thinking of some more questions, if you'd like, I'm going to go ahead and just go through a couple of these other slides. I wanna make sure you know how you can submit an official comment on the record. We do take these in various ways. So you can um, mail those in. And um, for those, we do have some folks on the phone. so. I'm going to at least give you the uh, address if you wanna mail those in. Otherwise, you can always give us a call and we can get you the address or information that you need to. But if you wanna mail those in, those are gonna to go to Annette Switzer. She's our permit section manager. Um, and the address is PO Box 30260, Lansing, Michigan, 48909. We also will take email comments. Um, we have a, a specific email address that you can send public comments in, and that email address is eagle, E-G-L-E dash A-Q-D dash P-T-I public comments, and P-T-I public comments is all one word, and that's at michigan.gov. We have started a new thing relatively recently um, where you can actually call and leave your comment on a voicemail. So I think we might have had somebody take advantage of that, but up until a little while ago, we hadn't had anybody call yet, but the phone number for that is 517-284-0900. So if you know folks that don't have internet access, that would be some, uh, a way for them to be able to call and leave a comment as well. We're going to be having an actual public hearing, a virtual public hearing, I should say, not actual where we're live, but um, a virtual public hearing on September 9th. So we're going to do kind of a similar thing to this where we have an information session in the beginning, um, kind of bring you guys some more information potentially if you want to participate in that. And then once the Q&A session is over or at seven o'clock, whichever comes first, we're going to go ahead and start the hearing. And just as a reminder, if you're planning on participating in that, during the hearing, we can't respond to your comments. So that the Q&A part, if you want an actual answer, is probably the best way to go about it. Um, I see we did have a question and we'll definitely get to that. So 
but I, just as we're kind of going through this, just to let you know that you, we have a lot of other information on there. You know, you can dig as deeply into this as you'd like, um, but we do have other information on our public notice page. So to get to that, you would just go to michigan.gov air, and then you would go ahead and click on permits on the left-hand side of the screen, and then pick um, PTI NSR public notice, and you'd be able to find information on FCA and any other permits we have out for comment right now. So I'm gonna go ahead and put our contacts on the screen. And so if you are watching and you wanna jot anything down, um, you can feel free to do that while we get to the rest of our questions here. All right, so this question is going to be going to Susan again. So Susan, this is in regard to air monitoring. And it says, when FCA installs their air quality monitor, will Eagle be monitoring its data directly or does it come into FCA first? So can you talk a little bit about the process um, with that? Sure. Uh, so when FCA starts to do their air monitoring, generally companies like FCA would hire a professional environmental consultant to actually do the sampling, do the air monitoring, um, because those, those professionals um, know how to do that and follow all the EPA requirements. So generally a facility would hire a consultant who would come in and do the actual air monitoring and then they will be sending us the data um, probably in, in the form of some kind of report. So we, we won't be able to monitor or view their data in real time. Um, we just, we don't have the, I guess, capability to kind of connect into their systems. And it, it's commonplace for them to send something like a monthly report um, or send us the, the data after um, you know, 30 days or 45 days. I'm not sure what the reporting time is going to be, but that's typically how it's done with other facilities. That way they, they can get their data um, report from the consultant and then pass it on to us. Okay, thank you. Um, so this question is going to go to Dave. Dave, can you talk a little about, and actually Bob, my Maybe better. I don't know. You got, I'm going to pass it today first, but this has to do with the cumulative amounts of VOC and PM 2.5 emissions from the facilities as a whole, not necessarily just from these. And if we don't have an answer to this, at, you know, on the top of our heads, that's okay. We can definitely respond back specifically about this question to the asker. Um, but I don't, do you have any idea on those cumulative amounts? Um, the VOCs from JNAP are approximately 700, um, 775 tons per year or so. Uh, MAC is still under construction. Um, that's for VOCs. For PM 2.5, I don't know the answer off the top of my head. Um, and that's for allowable, not necessarily actual emissions. That's what. Well, that's what that is actual emissions from okay, gotcha. from JNAP. Okay. Um, the allowables after, after that would be approximately, um, approximately, I believe in the 1300 ton per year range. However, there is, the actuals are not expected to be nearly that high. That would be the allowables in the 1300 ton per year range, 1350, I believe, okay. tons per year. Uh, again, PM 2.5 would be approximately 50 tons per year allowable from there, but it's not expected to be, you know, actuals are not expected to be that high either okay. based off of the analysis. But um, I, I can get back to you about the current PM 2.5 from the JNAP plant. Okay. Um, I just don't have that on the top, uh, right on the top of my tip of my tongue. Okay. And we can always respond back directly to the asker on that one as well. And I thought I had a hand up, but I don't see it now. So um, we still have a few more minutes if anyone has any other questions. That is, um, all right, I wanted to make sure you guys got this. And like I said, we will be having that other information session and hearing on the 9th. So if you'd like to join us for that in the interim, you can always reach out to any of us to ask questions. We're happy to help you. Um, after this meeting is over, so I did say in the beginning that we were recording this, we will send anyone who registered with a valid email address a follow-up that will include kind of some of the information we talked about tonight, definitely links to the information associated with the FCA proposed permits, 
um, just so you have that kind of at your fingertips. I'll send you some information on the air monitoring that we talked about tonight as well. Um, and then I will give you also a link to the recording in case you're interested and a link to that hearing as well if you want to register for that hearing ahead of time. Um, but otherwise, I'm not seeing any other questions right now. So I would really like to thank everyone for coming tonight. Really appreciate it. Again, this is kind of our the first time of us sharing this information about these FCA draft permits. So definitely give us your feedback, ask us your questions um, when you get a chance. But other than that, I hope you guys have a really great evening and um, yeah, well, we'll hope to see you on, on the 9th of September.